Welcome to this presentation, the first of several that we'll be having over the chapter uh, relating to discovery, which is chapter 10. This first section, we're going to cover the basics of discovery, kind of an overview of what the process looks like. I'm not going to go in depth on each one of these slides. Um, you'll want to review these at your leisure to kind of get the, the details, the, the minutia out of them. I'm going to give more of a, of a broad view of the topic. Um, it's not really helpful for me to read the slides to you, obviously, but where I can add some additional value or put things into context, that's what I'm hoping to do as we go forward. So let's begin. This, again, this is an overview. We're going to talk about a discovery, kind of a broad picture format. And I think it's helpful when we talk about discovery to start by saying, well, what is discovery? I mean, what is the definition of the term? And um, what it is is the process by which both sides in a litigation find out the facts of the, of the case, find out where the bodies are buried, metaphorically speaking, and they exchange information, and they also develop the information. Now, discovery is that formal process, and there's also an informal process that we've talked about in previous chapters, wherein people gather information that they have access to independently of the discovery process. For example, um, I can interview my own client. I can talk to witnesses who want to talk to me. I can um, uh, request documents from various people who want to assist me. I can do all of that outside the discovery process and it's very likely that I will have done so um, for my client significantly before the discovery process starts. It makes sense so that I can, uh, if I'm the plaintiff, prepare my complaint. If I'm the defendant, prepare my answer. And in fact, I'm really required to do so because Rule 11 requires that attorneys who sign pleadings in in a case or motions in a case have done an independent investigation of the facts and that's that informal discovery process. But this chapter, chapter 10, isn't about the informal discovery process, it's about the formal process. And because it involves um, the opposing party sharing information, as you can imagine, it um, can be a contentious process. Um, I want, if I'm a, a one of the parties uh, to a case, I want to get the other side's information for sure. That's going to be very helpful for me. It's going to save me money. It's going to, um, facts that they've developed that might cost me a lot to, to locate, they are going to have to give to me. And that's going to save me money. But even more importantly than that is it's going to help me get stuff that I otherwise would not. I will be able to get statements and information from people who otherwise wouldn't be cooperating with me. So um, let's talk a little bit about why we have discovery. But before we get started, let me contrast our system with a system that exists in most other countries. Most of the countries have limited discovery, uh, meaning that there are, might be some limited things that the two parties have to share in litigation. But in civil matters, um, not too many countries have an involved um, and as detailed and as demanding discovery process that we do. There are some really important advantages to our system, and there are some really unfortunate disadvantages to our system. Whether you think and balance the discovery is a good thing or a bad thing, though, it's a thing that we have, and there's no indication that it's going away. In fact, I would say, if anything, it's becoming um, more extensive, not less extensive. Let's first of all talk about the, the negative things about discovery. What people, when they, when people maybe from other cultures, other legal systems, look at our system, and they say, we prefer not to have it, what are the reasons they take that position? Well, one of the big reasons is that it's very expensive. Um, uh, this process of sharing information means that both sides end up um, expending a lot more money uh, to litigate a particular case. Um, it's very common for large corporations to uh, budget $100,000 pretty much automatically when they get sued in a matter that they don't think they can motion out, they, that they think they will actually have to go to trial on. Um, typically in the American system, those one, that $100,000 is not going to be reimbursable from the, uh, the plaintiff, and so that's just money that they've lost. Well, if you're a business and you get sued routinely, and there's certainly industries where that's a very common thing, well, you're going to have to pass that cost on to your uh, your your uh, customers or your shareholders, some source of, of uh, compensation. And so that means that, that uh, 
the, the things of, uh, the things that we buy in this grocery store or the the department store are going to be more expensive because of these costs um, and so that's one reason why some cultures have said no we don't think that this is a useful thing obviously paralegals and, and attorneys think it's a great thing because it means we have more business and we can have more opportunities to build money but from a global sense of, of the costs of, of uh, the legal system it is a very significant legal cost another problem that some people identify with the discovery process is that it elongates things and the discovery process typically takes six months it is the single longest period of time uh, that a case is in litigation um, it's uh, much longer than the pleadings time period it's much longer certainly than the trial time period only the um, appeals time period typically is going to be longer and most of that time period nothing's happening and so um, it can drag drag out the process pretty significantly so those are some important reasons why some legal systems quite understandably have said discovery or in-depth discovery is not for us but let's look for a second at the benefits to our system because obviously we don't do it because we want to spend more time or because we want to call, uh, raise our the legal bills we do it because we think it has value and um, there's there's really uh, it's really designed to help us avoid trial by surprise imagine for a second that I am an employee or I was an employee who was dismissed uh, my employer has dismissed me or he's told me he's dismissing me because I was tardy to work but I don't believe that's the real reason in fact I think it's because of my race or my religion or my gender or some other legally protected category but I know that my my boss my supervisor is savvy enough to know not to say Groover we're firing you because you're a woman or Groover we're firing you because you're a Methodist or any characteristic along those lines because my employer knows well that's an unlawful reason and so he's not going to offer that reason he's going to offer a reason that is lawful and so I know that the words out of his mouth aren't going to uh, indict him but I can look at the circumstances and maybe I make comparisons and think well there are other people who've been tardy to work and they're still there and they happen to be of a different religion or different race or, or whatever the the uh, aspect that I think might be the reason for my uh, belief that, that I was a victim of discrimination and so um, I decide to file a lawsuit over it there's a whole process involved but we'll just jump to the lawsuit part of, of the process and um, we actually go out we don't have a discovery in the system we go to trial well how am I going to prove that I was the victim of we'll say it's age discrimination um, well I can prove that I'm over the age of 40 that's a legal threshold and I can prove that I was discharged and I can perhaps even prove that I didn't have a terrible attendance record but I don't have access to the attendance record of my colleagues um, I don't have access to any kind of data about anyone other than myself and I may not even have good data on myself because I probably didn't write down every time that I clocked in or, or something along those lines um, I don't have access to emails that my boss may have sent to HR to talk about what what my boss should do about me so I'm really flying blind going into trial for those of y'all that have ever had a chance to watch the show Perry Mason uh, when when Perry Mason and he was a criminal defense attorney so it was a little bit different situation that we're talking about here in a civil situation but in those cases he would call a witness and he would ask a question and invariably one of the witnesses would confess or reveal that important fact and everyone was somewhat surprised or actually usually quite surprised sometimes including Perry usually he didn't know for sure where he was going was going to be fruitful or even if he thought it was definitely getting at the right information he wasn't sure the person would actually admit to whatever the fact is he was flying by there was the real chance that there was going to be trial by surprise and you can see in my case where I am uh, protesting against age discrimination the employer could present all kinds of things all kinds of facts that I'm completely unaware of and can hide facts from me that would be useful for my case so the odds of me winning an employment discrimination case um, without assistance from inside the organization um, 
without discovery, it would be slim or none. It'd be very, very difficult to do so. And so that's one of the concerns that we have, that there are a whole category of, of types of disputes where you really need to share information for typically the plaintiff to even have a chance at being successful. And so it helps us find out the other side's facts. And um, it helps us know about the strengths and weaknesses of our case and also the other side's case. And that can be very helpful actually at trial, of course, but can also be very helpful in settling a case. Let me give you an example of that. When I was in private practice, I was um, involved in a, a case in California. California has an interesting constitutional provision. Uh, their state constitution provides that personnel records are protected, um, th th there's a privilege, a confidentiality associated with it. So when an, um, a, 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 let's say Bob, Bob sues his former employer, and Bob, as part of the discovery process, requests certain uh, personnel files that are related to the situation, well, in California, the employer does not immediately give up those personnel files as the employer would do in other jurisdictions. In uh, California, there will need to be a hearing and only certain aspects of that personnel file will be discoverable by um, the, the former employee because of this con constitutional uh, provision in California. Anyway, so, so what happens is that the um, employer will go through the personnel file and do a privilege log for all of those documents explaining what it is. And so, for example, documents that included, say, the social security number of the person, well, that information would have to be redacted. Um, information about the person's medical circumstances would probably redact, be redacted unless it was relevant to the case. And so it's really a page-by-page -page review. Well, I had a case in, um, in California and in that case, we'll say Sally had filed a lawsuit. Um, Sally was Caucasian, and uh, she was complaining about the way her supervisor treated her. Her supervisor was also Caucasian. Uh, she alleged that her supervisor ca uh, caused her um, a great deal of distress one day when he approached her um, at work and got very physically close to her, and while he didn't strike her or swear at her, he spoke in a very angry voice and in a way that she interpreted as very threatening. Well, Sally suffered from some mental illness and this incident, in her opinion, caused her to have a breakdown and required um, a, an extended period of time off work and she said that this boss uh, provoked this. So she's suing based upon this incident. Well, um, not surprisingly, as one would expect, Sally wanted the personnel file. We'll say that her supervisor's name was Bob. She wanted Bob's personnel file. And again, this was a store, uh, uh, a client in California. And so um, we went through this process of, of doing the privilege log of his personnel file. And we listed all of the documents. But as you can imagine, it takes a while to go through. This had been a long-term employee, so there were hundreds and hundreds of pages. So it takes a while to develop that, and then there's going to have to be a hearing about that. Well, in the interim, um, the court ordered that we go to mediation to try to resolve the case. Well, before the mediation, and while we were preparing the, the uh, privilege log, I saw a document in the file that was very concerning. Um, Bob had several years earlier made an inappropriate joke. It had a racial dimension to the joke. Um, it was something that would offend almost everyone and would be especially offensive to African Americans. Um, in the particular county in which this case was going to be tried, it was almost a certainty that we would ha be having African American jurors. If they were to see this document, they would not think well of Bob, but even if even Caucasian or Asian or Hispanic uh, jurors would not think well of Bob when they saw this, this joke that he made. Now, it had no relevance to the case because there was no allegations uh, that Sally was of a different race or that uh, Bob was saying anything with a racial component to it. Um, uh, there was also no aspect to, to this, this 
off, not off color, but, but racially offensive joke that Bob made, that Bob was angry at the time or that he had yelled or done any, any kind of thing along those lines. It was just his attempt, very bad attempt at a joke. And so it was hard to see a connection between that joke 10 years before and the incident that he had with Sally. Well, 10 years before when he had this incident, um, it had come to the attention of his boss and his boss had uh, given him a disciplinary action. And so that's how it ended up in his personnel file. Uh, since that time, he hadn't had any additional um, incidents of that. So it appeared that um, he was not engaging in those types of behaviors um, since that date. Well, um, it was pretty easy to imagine that the plaintiff's attorney would very much like to get this document in front of the jurors. It was unclear whether the plaintiff's attorney would be able to, whether the judge would permit it, because it didn't seem to be very relevant to the case. But state court judges oftentimes will have a more lax attitude about what goes into evidence and what doesn't. And so it was, it was uncertain if, uh, whether uh, the jury would ever see it. If the jury never saw this very damaging document, then we had a very good chance, we felt, of winning the lawsuit. Because again, uh, it seemed like he just, uh, Bob was just angry and expressed reasonable anger because of what Sally had been doing. Um, her reaction was, was out of proportion to um, the provocation. Um, but if that document came into evidence, it had to color the juror's opinion about Bob globally and would, might cause the, the jurors to be so angry about what Bob had done in the past that it decides to reward Sally, even though Sally had nothing to do with that previous incident. So it moved a case that might have had two, three thousand dollars worth of settlement value up to, you know, maybe the fifty to a hundred thousand dollar range in this particular jurisdiction. Well, um, so we're going into uh, the settlement meeting. And we have had to produce the privilege log, but we haven't had the hearing. Well, the way I describe the documents in the privilege log are sufficiently vague that it won't be obvious what our concern is about that particular document. And we have the date and the title of the document, but it doesn't really communicate anything of, of, of the, the nature of the document. And so from the plaintiff's attorney's perspective, eh, he's probably thinking this isn't such a great case. I might be able to get five, ten thousand dollars possibly out of it, but I'm not going to get much money because there's really nothing here because he doesn't know about this document. So I'm charged with settling the case before this privilege log hearing where very likely the judge will look at the document and decide that this is a document that the other side is entitled to. Again, doesn't mean that it's going to get into evidence in the trial, but it means there's at least that possibility which is going to change the way the plaintiff's attorney views the case. So you can see how um, the discovery process can really dramatically impact settlement possibilities. Let's go on from here. Okay, so let's talk about how discovery works. Discovery, I think this is a little bit surprising, or at least it would be surprising to me if I hadn't seen it work, is that it seems like it would require a lot of judicial oversight. After all, we have two, two sides who are opposed to each other. I mean, it's a zero-sum situation. The plaintiff wins and the defendant has to pay, or the defendant wins and the plaintiff gets nothing. Um, and so we have two people who are really opposed to each other and they're having to share information. Um, that doesn't seem like that would go smoothly. And certainly there's many times where discovery doesn't go smoothly. But more often than not, it goes pretty smoothly um, because uh, the attorneys have, are charged with ethical obligations in this regard. Plus the attorneys know that if they cause problems, the judge is going to get mad at them. And the judge is probably going to say, yep, yeah, whatever, you know, you need, to, you need to reveal whatever it is. It's, it's not that common that the judge says, you're right, you don't have to share that information. So there's not a lot of judicial involvement. In fact, for the most part, judges don't like to be involved in discovery disputes. It's not very interesting stuff. Um, in federal court, it's very often that magistrate judges will actually handle discovery disputes. Um, magistrate judges are not Article III judges. They are um, employees of the court system. Uh, it's still, it's a, a very, uh, very high status 
role to have, but it's not the same as being a uh, federal court judge. And so many times the judge will, will uh, give the magistrate's authority to handle these matters. If you actually end up in front of your judge, you want to make sure that your judge is going to be on your side because um, judges don't like discovery disputes and really expect the parties to do everything possible to keep it out of the judge's uh, area that, that he's going to have to get involved in it. And so um, if, if the other side is threatening to go to the judge, you're going to pause and think, now wait a second, is there any argument out there that the judge might look at what I did and not think it's right? If there is, I'm going to want to, to maybe re-examine my behavior and, and give a little bit in this area. Another aspect is that there's a lot of flexibility with discovery. The order of discovery, what particular questions are asked, um, it's not a lockstep system. Um, many attorneys have systems where they, which they commonly use, and we'll talk about some common orders, but um, it is certainly within the realm of possibility that you mix things up, and there can be very good reasons why you change the order of things from time to time. Obviously, scheduling problems can be one reason you change the orders, but also there can be strategic reasons why you might want to. Um, discovery is not a matter that is subject to appeal for the most part, at least not until after you have had your trial. Uh, let's pause and talk for a second about interlocutory appeals. Um, um, an interlocutory appeal is um, an appeal that happens before you have the final trial. For the most part, interlocutory appeals are just going to be in situations where there's privilege. The court's going to usually say, you know what, if the, if the judge did something wrong before trial, well, if it's a serious enough problem and you lose at trial, then you can always appeal it. Uh, it's only really when the, the judge does something that can't be undone, even in a second trial, that um, the court allows those interlocutory or mid-case before the end of the case uh, appeal. And that would be in a, in a privileged situation. So let's say that um, you believe that a particular document is privileged, but the judge is insisting that you hand that over to the other side. Well, if the judge is right, then you should hand it over to the other side. If the judge is wrong, the act of you handing it over waives the privilege. It can't be gotten back. It can't be undone. Those documents can't be unseen. And so that can be the basis of an interlocutory appeal. But for the most part, discovery matters just aren't going to be subject um, to um, appeals until after the case is over. When we're looking at discovery, we're going to be looking at the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. We're obviously going to look at local rules as well, and there are some local rules in the Eastern District. And then judges can have their own requirements, kind of their maybe the most local rules, what that particular judge does with discovery issues. We have five tools for discovery, and um, this is actually a pretty common order for it. I would put this one at the end. But sometimes people do these earlier. It, again, there's no set order. Um, an interrogatory are written questions that you send to the other side, and they are required to answer those under oath. Request for production, the request for production of documents or stuff or data. Um, and this is when you share the, the paper and the, and the data that you have. Again, similar to interrogatories, but instead of having to answer the questions, you're just sending the stuff to the other side. Depositions are very similar to interrogatories, except instead of them being written questions, they are oral questions that are answered under oath. A big difference, another big difference between interrogatories and deposition questions is that deposition questions are answered in real time. There's a court reporter there, there's a question pending, the deponent, the person being, being deposed, answers the question before another question comes up, so there's no opportunity to talk with one's attorney in that situation. With interrogatories, you have 30 days to come up with your answers, and so there's a regular um, exchange of information between the attorney and the paralegal working along with the client. And so once the answers to the interrogatories are submitted, they are thoroughly lawyered up. Um, deposition answers can't really be lawyered up in the same way. I mean, you've prepared your clients the best you can. You've hopefully talked through uh, uh, concerns about the testimony, how to approach certain questions. 
but at the end of the day, the witness is on his or her own to answer them. Then we have requests for physical and mental examination. This is our first discovery tool that is not pretty much automatic in litigation. Um, many cases don't involve situations where there's a physical, and when we say physical and mental, we're talking about physical and mental examination of humans, of parties to the case, either the plaintiff or the defendant. It's usually going to be the plaintiff. Um, so, you, so let's say the plaintiff said he was in a car accident and he has suffered an injury as a result. But the degree of injury is in dispute. Well, it might be appropriate to have a physical examination or, in certain cases, a mental examination. But again, those are really restricted to the particular facts of the case. Um, most cases, or many cases, don't involve that. And uh, the party has to, the party who's seeking it, um, has to request that type of view. And because of the very personal, um, nature of those types of, of reviews, understandably, the, the person who's, a, who's going to be examined um, oftentimes doesn't want that type of examination, and so um, the court is, is sensitive to that concern, and there really needs to be a legal basis for it. And then we have requests for admission. These are um, almost a little bit like uh, we did with the complaint where we have the complaint and then the defendant has to answer each one of the questions, admit or deny. Well, these are a series of statements and the other side, it can be the plaintiff asking the questions of the defendant or the defendant asking the questions of the plaintiff. Anyway, the, uh, the person asking the questions lists a, a series of statements, almost like a true false test. And then the um, other side will say either I admit that or I deny that or I uh, lack sufficient knowledge to admit or to deny it. Um, you can't deny a fact simply because you wish it weren't true. You have to, you know, it's a, I mean, it's, it's a statement that you're making for the court. Um, and so that is the final discovery tool that we have. So let's go to our next slide. So the paralegal really shines in discovery. Um, while certainly attorneys are involved, especially with depositions, I would say that paralegals usually have the, the leading role, especially once they're a seasoned, experienced uh, paralegal. Uh, they are the ones who are drafting requests. They're drafting the responses to the request. They're gathering the information. Um, they're helping the attorney prepare the, the, their witnesses for depositions. They're organizing the documents that the attorney is going to use during the deposition, and they're summarizing depositions after the fact. They may be selecting expert witnesses and uh, for physical and mental examination, selecting the physician and preparing the witness for that process. So there's a, a really important role that the paralegal has in the discovery process, uh, probably more than any other part of time. And that's because the discovery process is so important, the paralegal is so important uh, for that because of that role. Many um, attorneys think of the discovery process as the single most important part of the case. Um, it's where many cases are won or, or lost. So obviously having a very skilled and experienced and knowledgeable and sophisticated and strategic paralegal can make all the difference in these types of cases. So let's look at what needs to be shared in discovery. What is the scope of discovery? Well, we're going to look at a rule in a second, this rule, Rule 26, which is an important discovery rule. But let's just go through the checklist, and then we'll look at the rule in just a second. Well, first of all, whatever we're being required to share has to not be privileged. If it's privileged, we don't have to share it, and that includes attorney work product privilege. Um, there is going to be a process, though, that we're going to have to prove the privilege or the work product. Obviously, it has to have some level of relevance, but this term is broadly interpreted. And then there's an idea of proportionality. This is a relatively new concept. Last the three or four years, we've, we've seen this uh, concept, or actually the, the Federal Rule Civil Procedure 26 was amended to look at the issue of proportionality. Before the amendment, you could have a case for $5,000, and let's say it was based upon a federal question, and yet you could propound discovery requests that would cause the other side to spend $100,000, and the court wouldn't necessarily look at proportionality. That didn't make a lot of sense, especially as discovery became more and more expensive. And so um, the proportionality rule means that lots of different factors are considered 
when the court is trying to decide whether a particular discovery request is just too broad, too big. One is how important is the issue um, that the, uh, dis the, the pr proposed discovery would affect? What's the amount of controversy? How much is the plaintiff going to get if he's successful? If it's just a little amount, it doesn't make sense to have really broad discovery. Then also, how, how easy it is for the parties to access the relevant information. If the defendant has pretty easy access, then the court may well say, hey, use your, your access to this. You don't need the plaintiff to do this for you. Resources. Typically, the defendant is going to have more resources, either because it's a corporation or because it has some kind of insurance. Typically, plaintiffs don't sue people who uh, don't have a lot of resources. There's not much point in doing so. Oftentimes, the plaintiff doesn't have as many resources, and certainly that can be a factor in deciding who's going to bear that cost. Um, how important is this discovery? Uh, of course, what does it go to an important issue? But also, how likely is it to really resolve that issue? And uh, then, of course, weighing the burden against its benefit. It's kind of a summary, you might say, of what we've talked about before. So I'm going to, at this time, go over to the rule, uh, uh, rule 26, Federal Rule of Civil Procedure. Here we go. Okay, and we're looking here. We're gonna look at, let me just go to the top here. We're looking at Rule 26, the duty to disclose and general provisions governing discovery. So this rule is, is kind of our first uh, look at, under the rules, how discovery is supposed to work. Um, it doesn't go into the minutia of each type of discovery tool. So we're going to look at the scope of, of discovery generally. And here we have the actual language, and you can see um, that this tracks, in fact, my slide basically um, is duplicating this. Unless otherwise limited by court order, the scope of discovery is as follows. Parties may obtain discovery regarding any non-privileged matter that is relevant to any party's claim or defense, and here we have that word, proportional to the needs of the case, considering, and then here are the factors that we need to look at, or how, what the court is going to look at. Okay, so let's go back to our, um, our, our slideshow. You are the paralegal in the case. The attorney has um, put you... Um, in charge of proceeding with discovery, or we're coming up with a discovery plan. Um, right now, you probably have the complaint and the answer, and you have your um, initial informal investigation. And now you're trying to figure out what do I do next? Well, we have step one right here. So this is what you do next. Um, you're going to look at that litigation chart, chart that we talked about in previous chapters. And many of the boxes in that chart will already be filled in with your informal. Um, uh, discovery or fact gathering efforts, but there will be holes in it or and even areas that are filled in you may think well But there's better evidence out there And so you're going to be looking and going well who's going to be able to give me this or how will I get this piece or what's the best? Scenario for getting that piece and so you're going to identify What can you not obtain informally at all? I mean obviously if you can't get it from anyone you're going to have uh, through through their just acquiescence, then you're going to want to use the discovery tools so that you can get it. But sometimes you've gotten the thing, you just don't have an admissible form. You don't have a chain of custody uh, uh, with respect to it, uh, or you have a marked up version that isn't the original or something like that. You need to get one that's going to be admissible. Um, the, the marked up one, the, the inadmissible one you have right now may be very useful at this stage, but it's not going to help you out very much at all at trial. And as we uh, covered in chapter nine, um, it's important to know how things, uh, whether something is admissible or what, where something is not admissible. Because if you're the one in charge of discovery and you assume something is in an admissible form when in fact it isn't, and then at trial you realize, oh my gosh, it's not admissible, well, you're going to be locked out of presenting that to the jury most likely. So it's a big deal, and it's important for you as the paralegal to be aware of the ins and outs. Now, obviously, you're not going to be an expert in all the rules of evidence. No one would expect you to be, but you need to at least be aware enough to talk with the attorney. Hey, I think this might be a problem, or I'm not sure. What do you think about this? And get that conversation started. Okay, sometimes you have witnesses that... Um, 
can be a little squirrely. <laughs> I'll give you an example of, of this. Um, I had a case once where, we'll go back to Bob and Sally. Sally uh, was, Sally worked in a warehouse, as did Bob, and Bob was, he was a little odd, I'll be honest with you. Um, you just, he, he gave, I'll, I'll give you a highly technical term for it. He gave you the heebie-jeebies being around him. There was just something a little smarmy about him, and you just kind of felt like you wanted to take a shower after you spent very much time with him. I mean, he never said anything wrong to me. He never did anything wrong, but I always felt a little creeped out by him. Anyway, Sally had been dismissed, and she alleged that Bob had engaged in a series of fairly bizarre behaviors. Um, one thing, for example, that she alleged that Bob did was, obviously, in a warehouse environment, there would sometimes be rats, and they would have um, rat traps set up in various places to you know, kill the rats. Anyway, um, apparently, um, somebody... Uh, Sally thought it was Bob had taken one of these dead rats and put it in the drawer and you know his neck was broken by the rat trap and he was just dead inside the drawer of her um, desk and there was no trap there and so somebody had to put it in there and Sally was convinced it was Bob very very creepy thing but I gotta say as soon as I heard the story I thought to myself yeah, Bob's the kind of guy I might think might do that. I mean, Bob was my client. I didn't know he did it. I assumed he didn't do it. But, you know, I, I could kind of see maybe it might do that kind of thing. Anyway, um, so eventually Sally is fired for various and sundry issues, and she sues, and she alleges sexual harassment um, because, again, she alleged that Bob also made passes to her and other, other behavior. Well, Bob had a second in command. We'll call him Larry. And Larry was kind of the reverse of Bob. Bob was old. He had a big paunch. He didn't dress very well. He wasn't very articulate. But Larry was trim. He wore a suit. He was rather nice looking, significantly younger, and very articulate and charming. And you immediately felt a connection with him. He had charisma. You know, there, there was a, a dynamism about him that was kind of compelling. And, and honestly, you spent much time with him. You started thinking, how come Larry's not the boss um, instead, of, instead of Bob? Well, as the case progresses, I had several opportunities to talk to Larry. And um, Larry was real, very uh, forthcoming with me. He would say things like, you know, uh, I know Bob comes across as a little creepy, but he's actually a great guy. And no, he did not put a rat inside Sally's office. And, you know, I have no reason to think that he made any passes at Sally. I mean, I don't know that for sure I wasn't with him every second of the day, but I, I just don't think that's true. And so Larry was really supporting Bob. And I have to say, I really thought that that was a good thing because I'm thinking to myself, well, if Bob gets fired, Larry's probably going to get his job. And so, you know, Larry kind of had an incentive to, um, to, to, to turn on Bob, but there was just, it seemed like he was really a stand-up guy um, telling the truth as he saw it. Anyway, the case progressed, and as we went through the discovery process, we started realizing that whenever we, whenever a Sally deposed somebody, it seemed like Sally knew information that she really shouldn't have known. We kind of felt like somebody in the office must have been feeding information to Sally, but we couldn't really figure out who. I mean, we thought maybe a secretary or uh, maybe one of Sally's coworkers, and so we decided, well, we would just feed one little fact to, to somebody um, and see if, if that popped up, and they were made up facts. Um, to see if it popped in the next deposition to kind of see who our uh, Benedict Arnold was, so to speak. Anyway, um, the, the, the fake facts weren't popping up. Um, so we were really kind of confused. Only the real facts were showing up. Anyway, the case progressed a little bit farther. And um, one night, uh, or actually the, the next day, I guess, um, one of the employees comes knocking on Bob's door and asks to meet with Bob. And Bob, you know, invites him in. They sit down and the employee says, listen, I was in an out-of-the-way restaurant quite a piece from here 
And guess what I saw? I saw Sally and Larry having drinks and being very, very affectionate toward each other. And so, um, of course, Bob relays this to me. I go down to the facility. I talk to the person who, who shared this information. She seemed very credible. And it started making sense. I mean, because Larry knew the fake stories that we had conveyed were fake stories. And he knew all of the good facts. And so if he really was feeding information to Sally, um, it would make sense the information that Sally had and then it started making sense to me too maybe the reason that Larry had stood up for Bob was that he wanted me to feel that Larry was really on Bob's side and therefore I would be more forthcoming with him and lo and behold when we checked some some email accounts some company email accounts we discovered that yes Larry had been corresponding with Sally and some of it was pretty you know uh, Maybe not R rated, but at least PG 13 rated. And so it became clear that Sally and, and Larry had this, this scheme that they were going to, you know, Sally was going to be successful in this lawsuit, Bob was going to get fired, Larry was going to get the promotion, and everyone was going to live happily ever after, except for Bob. And so, in fact, Bob did end up being the stand up guy. Um, you can see in that scenario. Uh, so, so what we did, we didn't, we did not confront Larry directly, but we decided what we would do is we would depose Larry and see how he answered the deposit. Or actually, we waited until the other side wanted to depose Larry to see how he was going to be deposed. And we were actually kind of surprised they hadn't deposed um, Larry already. And they didn't schedule his deposition. They didn't schedule his deposition, even though he's an important witness. And that was our second clue that Larry wasn't as he appeared. Because you always want to nail down the testimony of the other people. You don't want them to be able to change their testimony. And so you want to depose the important witnesses from the other side, not so much because you think their testimony is going to help you, but so that you can uh, prepare around that testimony. You can punch holes in the story. You can find witnesses who will contradict that story. And so you want to know exactly what they're going to say. Because witnesses will say one thing to you and something else to the other side. They can be playing both. Sometimes it's sneaky like Larry, certainly, but many times it's much less um, evil-minded. Uh, some people just like to be liked, and they like to, to say what people want to hear. And so they may just be coloring the story slightly differently for both speakers. And you may think this person is definitely on my side, and the other guy may be thinking the same thing. And so that can be very helpful to actually nail them down. And so people that you want to do this with obviously are opposing parties, witnesses who are hostile to you. Let's pause and talk about what a hostile witness is. A hostile witness is not an unpleasant human being. I mean, they can be, but they don't have to be. A hostile witness is somebody whose testimony is not um, helpful to your side. So he's hostile to your side, not hostile to you personally. He may be highly charming, and in fact, that would be bad. You don't want a highly charming hostile witness because the jury might find him compelling. Um, so if a witness is hostile for you, he's friendly for the other side. Again, when I say friendly witness, I don't mean he's a, he's a laugh riot or the, the, um, the toast of the town. I mean that he is on the side of the, the other side. And when I say on a side, that makes them sound like they're selling their testimony or something like that. No. I mean, virtually any witness testimony helps one side or the other. And so when I say that witness is on the plaintiff side, we don't, I don't mean that that witness is perjuring himself. I mean that in most cases, his truthful testimony happens to benefit that particular side. Then of course, you're going to want to nail down the experts of the witnesses and even favorable witnesses who may not be able to testify or who you're not 100% sure are going to stay favorable the Larrys of the world, in other words. Okay, so we've decided who we need to get data from, the witnesses we need. And now we're going to decide, well, how are we going to get at that information? And maybe we're going to use depositions. Maybe we're going to request documents from these witnesses. Maybe we're going to ask interrogatories. Uh, maybe we're going to do requests for admission. There's lots of different tools that we have uh, discovery methods, and as we might even use informal discovery methods uh, to accomplish these goals.
But once you've decided how you're going to get at those things, then you have to decide, well, what's the order that I want to use? Um, and again, this is a common order. Um, as I say, I think commonly this goes after depositions, um, but it can go either way. Typically, you start with interrogatories and requests for reduction. Many times you propound these at the same time. And this gets the basic information out of the way. This is especially helpful if you're the defendant and you really don't know kind of what the plaintiff's suing about. I mean, after all, the, the complaint can be a very short document. So this lets you figure out some more of the facts so that your deposition doesn't have to be seven hours long. Um, because the longer your deposition is, the more time it's taking you and time is money and the more expense it's going to be ordering that transcript. And so this can help you get some of the basic questions out of the way. Now, these aren't the best for telling certain parts of the story though certain parts of the story you're going to want to get to the deposition for example you're not going to be able to see body language after all these are written answers you're not going to be able to hear the uh, witnesses unlawyered response the lawyer is going to massage it the paralegal is going to massage it so it's it's going to be definitely edited and massaged and spun so to speak um, so it's, it has limited utility, but what it's good at, it's very good at. Um, so you're gonna do these two first. These you can do only of parties, um, but sometimes for non-parties with subpoenas in this case. But for interrogatories, it's just to parties. Um, and so that's another limitation. Many times you're gonna wanna depose people who are not parties. Depositions are helpful in that you get to see the body language of the person. You get to have them provide their unvarnished testimony. It's not the lawyer's testimony, it's their testimony. Um, you get to see them sweat. You get to see if they're likable. You get to see if they're believable. You get to see how they respond to stress questions, how they respond when you try to be their best buddy. All of those strategies you can see in a deposition. You can't see that through interrogatories. Requests for admission are a good way to authenticate documents and to tie up uncontroversial issues, facts that are not in dispute. Um, sometimes, though, people throw in controversial facts and requests for admission, um, hoping, not very likely to happen, but hoping that somebody misses the deadline. Because if you have been uh, sent requests for admission and don't respond within the time period, the 30 days, then everything on that list is deemed admitted. Well, you know, you might have inadvertently admitted something that's essential to the case, something that you otherwise would have absolutely have denied. Let's look at some terms we have. One is a term that we have is propounding discovery. That means sending discovery to the other side. And we hear this all the time. It's a very common word that we see. It's not a word we use in English otherwise. And the method that you propound it, well, it's going to involve getting it physically to them some way. So you're going to serve it to them. And we'll talk about methods that, that's going to, that, that you, you accomplish that. Um, you will only send it directly to the party if the party is unrepresented. But obviously, most of the time, the party is going to have an attorney. And if there's multiple uh, parties in the case, well, you're going to have to send it to all of the parties or their attorneys more likely. So if, if I, and let's say the, the style of the case is A plus B suing C plus D. Well, we're B and we're sending interrogatories to C. Well, obviously we're going to send it to C's attorney. But we're also going to have to send it to A's attorney, assuming that A and B don't share an attorney. And we need to send it to D's attorney, assuming that C and D don't share an attorney. Um, if you're sending it to a non-party and you can't send interrogatories to a non-party, but let's say you're sending a deposition request where you're going to subpoena them. Let's look at the word of subpoena for a second. Subpoena is a compound word. Actually, I guess this is a prefix. So it's not a compound word. Sub means under. And then PINA means penalty. And that means if you don't comply, you're under penalty. You violated um, a court order. And so you can be, a, uh, you can be subject to arrest and um, other penalties associated with that. So it, it raises the stakes. It motivates that non-attorney to appear. Because after all, um, parties to a case, the judge has the authority to say, hey, you didn't show up for your deposition, so I'm going to um, 
give you a sanction in a lawsuit, but a non-party doesn't care about the lawsuit because he's not going to benefit or be harmed by the lawsuit. And so this is the, the penalty that is associated with the, for the non-party. So how do we go about serving it? Here we have four methods. Uh, probably the most common one is certified mail return receipt requested. Um, you don't have to send it this way, but the neat thing about this is you get a receipt um, that's date stamped for the date that it was, was received, so you know it was received. Somebody has to sign for it. You can send it regular mail, but you're not gonna get that record. So if they turn around and say, oh, we never got it, it's more difficult for you to prove that. You can obviously hand deliver it. The benefit to that is it's especially helpful if you're right on the cusp of the close of discovery and you don't have the extra three days to play with because if you do it through US mail, you have to add three days to the 30 days you ordinarily have. So if you're say 31 days away from the discovery cutoff, you are gonna have to get it to them uh, today or tomorrow and you're gonna have to go with hand delivery. You can use services like FedEx or UPS, you'll get a, um, receipt under those circumstances and that shows that it was delivered and obviously it's being delivered by a person under those circumstances. I suppose the mailman's a person too but um, that doesn't count um, as hand delivery and then you also can email it. Um, uh, um, it, it, again under certain circumstances you have to check the local rules to see if that's a, a possibility or not and you can obviously have one of those receipts attached to it to have a record that it has been received and or opened. So the general rule is that um, you can only begin propounding discovery, you can only begin asking those questions after the Rule 26F discovery conference has taken place. Let's go look at that rule. So we're looking at 26F. Let's scroll down here. And here we have uh, the information we're here in F, Conference of the Parties Planning for Discovery. So we have the timing. Must confer as soon as practicable. They give us a date that it has to be done by. And then it talks about what are the party's responsibility. It talks about what's in a discovery plan. This is where you go. I can't emphasize enough that when you are involved in um, discovery issues, whether it's state or federal court, is that you look at the rule book. You don't just assume, okay, uh, I kind of know what the rule says. Uh, you need to look at the rules. The wonderful thing about the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure is they are so easy to understand. They are really written in a very user-friendly way. See, you're not gonna find yourself stumbling over them. They're not gonna be difficult for you to process. And so look at the rules to see what goes in the discovery plan. Oh, wait a second, here it is. This tells us exactly what has to be in the discovery plan. Well, let's go back. Um, and again, here's that exception, no more than 21 days after defendant has been served. Okay, uh, discovery deadlines are calculated from the date of request plus the three days. And typically people wait until the very last, even if they get them done early and attorneys never get things done early, but even if they do get it early, why, why give up some of that time? So you're gonna be serving them you, know, you may not wait to the very last day, but you're gonna wait until very close to the last day to provide that information. And most of the time you wait because you haven't had the time to get to it beforehand. And um, let's go to our next one. Here's that calculation method. The date that it's mailed is day zero. So day 30, so, so the next day is day one, day two, day three. And like all the other rules, you count every day between. Doesn't matter that day three is a Saturday. It doesn't matter that day one is a holiday. Um, you only care about the last day. When you get to day 30, let's say this was him delivering. You care now about day 30 because if day 30 is a Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday, then you wait until the next day. So if this is a Saturday, then you'd go to the 31st day, that would be a Sunday. So the 32nd day would be a Monday. Well, let's say that's Martin Luther King Day. So you'd end up being on the 33rd day because that would be the Tuesday, no longer a holiday. But it doesn't matter about the intervening days. The 29th day could be Martin Luther King Day. The 30th day is the day after. 
So therefore, there's no need to, or the deadline is the 30th day. You want to be sure to calendar all this stuff. Um, many times it is the paralegal's responsibility to calendar it. And no one's going to sit down and give you the deadline. They're not going to say, okay, by the way, you know, that means it's going to be due on this date. You have to sit down there and do the math and figure out the date and check to see is that a court holiday or not. Um, um, it's helpful sometimes to have another person check your math and uh, check to make sure you have an understanding about exactly when it was received and all that good stuff. Um, but you need to not only do the calculation correctly, but you also need to calendar it correctly. And you don't just calendar by saying, okay, the 30th day is, you know, September 14th. You have to have ticklers in the, in the date because if you wake up on September 14th and look at your calendar and say, oh, it's due today, but I haven't started on it then obviously you're not going to be able to accomplish it. So you would need, um, depending upon the request, you might need to start, you know, 29 days before, or you might have a little bit of leeway and not have to start exactly then. Um, if you miss the deadline, um, and it's not a request for admission, um, it's not quite as serious, um, but you're going to waive any objections to the request. So let's say you had some objections about them being overly broad and unduly burdensome and you supply your your answers on the 35th day well you mean your answers are your answers that's probably still going to be okay uh, the other side is going to have a hard time proving they were somehow prejudiced by it although they might be able to if depositions or something have been scheduled in the intervening days um, but you may have had some very good legal objections that now you don't have the opportunity to respond to Request for admission is even more serious. Again, everything you did not uh, submit by the date is deemed admitted. You are not going to be able to contest that at trial, no matter how bad that admission is for you. Um, just like the um, questions are going to be sent to all attorneys of record or parties if they're unrepresented, your replies, if you're the person uh, responding to the discovery, you need to send it to everyone as well. Let's talk about objections. Objections are a really important part of the discovery process. Um, almost all discovery tools are going to have a significant number of objections. Some of the objections are pro forma. Everybody uses them. You don't really expect um, there to be a lot of fuss about them. But sometimes the really important objections are going to be made, and the other side are going to contest it, and you're going to end up in a hearing. So you have to be sure that you've got a really good basis for it and that you're phrasing it in the right way. It's important that you craft that in a tight, tight way. Okay, so here's some examples of very common objections. Um, one is that it's not relevant in any way. Again, here that's a uh, the term of relevance is a very broad concept. You may recall when we were in Chapter 9, we talked about how broad that is. Another is the proportionality. This is probably more likely to be a merit, meritous argument. Now, it's very common when you're making an objection to throw all of the possible objections on there. You may be thinking, well, it really is relevant, but I'm going to say it's not relevant, but I'm really going to focus on the proportionality. And so you're going to say which one of these arguments. This is undu um, duplicative is another one. Hey, you've asked us some other way. You don't need the same data four different ways. And is it obtainable in a manner that's easier? Oh, let's go to the next one here. Overly broad and unduly burdensome. Um, that's very common um, a phrase that you'll see in these. Again, that's also related to proportionality. Um, then it's not in the right form, and of course the privilege. This is the most important in terms of, of things that you can uh, kind of shoot yourself in the foot and never get back, um, is if you do not make an objection to privilege and you uh, release some documents that would be privileged because you can't unring that bell. And we can see these, um, uh, we'll go up here to, um, 26B, and we can see those um, objections. You can see limitations on frequency and extent. Uh, 
about tangible things. Can't get it some other means. Um, these go at some of the objections that you might be able to advance. Um, I won't go through all of them. I have cited the particular rules with respect to um, each one of these. So let's go back, continue on. These are invalid objections. So you don't want to make these. One is that it's, it's inadmissible. Well, nobody cares it's inadmissible because we're not talking about getting into evidence. We're talking about getting into discovery. So lots of things that you're going to have the, the right to get through discovery are going to be inadmissible. But inadmissible evidence can lead to admissible evidence. Let me give you an example. Let's say that dur during a deposition, I ask um, Louise, what did Sally tell you? Well, that would call for hearsay, and I would not be allowed to ask that question in trial. But I can absolutely answer that question if what Sally said is relevant to the case. Because then I get to hear what Louise remembers Sally saying, and then I can make a judgment. Hmm, that's helpful. I think that's interesting information. Now I'm going to want to depose Sally. Or I might say, oh, that's not really helpful for me, so I don't really care about Sally. I'm not going to depose her. It helps point me in the directions that I want to go. Another, this is a very popular expression, um, fishing expedition. What the person is really getting at here is um, it's not relevant and it's not proportional. Proportional. It's really, um, they don't have something particular in mind. But this particular phrase, this particular way of looking at it is not something that's going to fly in federal court. State court, most likely yes. Federal court, you want to instead rephrase that idea as being either not relevant or not proportional. Okay, so let's talk about how you are going to um, approach the issue of privilege. So you've gotten a request for documents, but the, 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 the request as it's written would call for you sharing some documents that are privileged. Well, obviously you're not going to produce those documents because as soon as you produce them, even accidentally perhaps, then that privilege is waived. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna withhold them, but you can't just withhold them and pretend like they're not there. You have to reveal to the other side, hey, we've got stuff that is responsive to your question, but we're not providing it. And the reason why we're not is because we believe it's privileged. And so we have to make that statement. We have to actually state what the privilege is and we have to describe what it is. And we don't have to describe you know, the, the privileged part of it, what the, the substantive content says. But we have to describe, you know, for example, letter from attorney to plaintiff dated this date concerning scope of representation or something like that. Um, doesn't give away anything about the content, but it lets a lot, at, least, at least lets the, the parties know which document um, is, is in play. And the way that this is typically going to uh, uh, transpire is you're going to develop the person who's asserting the privilege is going to develop a privilege log, which is going to be shared with the court. So here's an example. Again, this is just the um, the uh, uh, the caption that you might use, and then here's an example of how the privilege log might read. Um, and again, here with the privilege. This is attorney work product privilege, but you might have, uh, in certain cases, doctor patient privilege, um, or um, some other privilege too, or attorney client privilege. Again, here is a signature block, again, very similar to the other signature blocks we've looked at in this case. And again, we have a certificate of service. By the way, if you haven't seen a certificate of service, this is a very classic one. We have the date. Oftentimes it's written in, especially obviously it's not going written in if it's served electronically, but uh, usually people will write the blank th of and then the month, in this case January, comma, and then the year. You'd write out the whole month of January and you would abbreviate it. The foregoing document was served to the following attorney. You're going to give the name and the address for the defendant by, and then you give the method of delivery. And then you have a place for the attorney to sign. Let's talk about ESI. ESI has changed discovery dramatically. When I started practicing law in 1990, when I was doing employment discrimination cases, a typical case, 
involved maybe three bankers boxes full of stuff. So this is basically, um, you know, three kind of smallish moving boxes might be all the data that an employer would, would provide to um, the uh, um, uh, uh, plaintiff in a particular case. Uh, let me give another example to this might be a, kind of interesting. Uh, when I was in, uh, in private practice, I worked on two death row cases. And so I was involved in a habeas corpus appeal in these two cases. And uh, part of our job was to look at the evidence file um, in this capital case. So in this case, what happened was uh, my client was sentenced to death because somebody uh, died and he was found guilty um, and was sentenced to death. And so we went to the, um, the courthouse and actually looked at the evidence file. You might think in a case like that that there'd be dozens of boxes at least. All of the evidence fit in one banker's box. That was it. So uh, criminal cases, I mean, certainly there are very sophisticated criminal cases involving, you know, uh, bank records and, e and ESI and other stuff, but uh, this was a case from, I guess it was from the 1980s. Yeah, from the 1980s. Um, there, was, there was none of that. I mean, there were ballistic reports and things like that, but it was a very a straightforward case with, with very little physical evidence. Anyway, so I'm contrasting that. So we have the, the criminal case, which has virtually no evidence, even though it involved you know, the death penalty. And then we have an employment discrimination case, which had some evidence, but certainly it was a manageable amount. I mean, uh, you know, uh, several, you know, three boxes, but, but not, I mean, something you could get through in a few days of, of going through it. If we were to litigate that same case, though, the data that would exist for that case would easily fill a whole room, and not a small room, a bedroom, from floor to ceiling. If all that data that is rele potentially relevant to the case were printed out, that's how much you would have. And the difference is that back in 1990, very little data was actually stored about employees or really about anybody on computers. But pretty soon companies started saying, well, I have all this paper, let's put everything in computers. And that probably wasn't so serious, but you know what happened, I'll give you an example from my type pennies, what happened with personnel files is that, you know, when, when John picked his insurance for that year, Sally, the uh, personnel clerk, would put in the, the piece of paper, the, the, the documentation that says, okay, Bob is picking Blue Cross Blue Shield. And then Sally would you know, remove the health insurance information from four years ago where Bob picked United Healthcare. So whenever she put a document in, not, not every time, but many times she would put a document in and take a document out. And so, you know, after 20 years of employment, your personnel file might be three inches thick, but it wasn't three feet thick. But the thing is with, with electronically stored data, data never goes away. And every little thing causes a bit of data. So every time John gets paid, there's all this data that is generated. Every time, let's say John's a salesperson, he makes a sale and he works on a commission basis. That generates data. Every time he sends an email, more data. Every time somebody talks about him in an email, more data. So you can see all of these uh, pieces of data wouldn't have existed or would have been a very, very small amount of data back, say, in 1990 compared to today. So it's a huge, huge issue. So what is ESI? Obviously, it stands for electronically stored data. It's all the computer-generated or electronically recorded information. It includes everything you can think of, and it's probably things on this list that I haven't included. Certainly emails, voicemails, any kind of recording, Facebook, uh, you know, uh, spreadsheets, uh, texts, um, things on hard drives, cloud uh, storage servers, all of these types of, of tools. Um, huge, huge, huge amounts of data. And it's very important. It's very important, it's very voluminous, and it's very expensive. It's expensive to um, gather together 
It's expensive to sort, and it's expensive as the person who receives it. What are you going to do about all this data? You know, I mean, you may have a, a billion pieces of data, and it's kind of like a needle in a haystack. There may be one or two awesome pieces of data somewhere in that mix, but how do you find it? You know, I mean, yes, you can look through each one of the pieces of data, but do you have the time? Do you have the money to do that? Maybe so, maybe not. But on both sides of the equation, it does involve a significant expense. Another thing to keep in mind about ESI, we'll talk about this when we get to metadata, but is the fact that ESI gives you more data than um, traditional paper printouts. Imagine for a second that I'm the supervisor um, and my employee is Larry. Um, I don't like Larry. Larry um, is Presbyterian, and I've just never cared for Presbyterians. And, um, you know, I've never said anything to him about it, but gosh, I just can't stand him. And I, his church is ugly, and uh, the people who go to his church, I don't like any of them. They're all mean, awful, awful people. And so I really just want Larry not to work here anymore. And um, so I'm looking for reasons to fire Larry. Maybe I'm aware of my prejudice. Maybe I'm not aware of my prejudice. But I'm looking for reasons to get Larry out of here. And Larry's done, made a couple mistakes. I mean, don't we all in our work eventually? Anyway, so I focus like a laser beam on that. And so um, I uh, prepare a reason for dismissal, and it's worded very tightly and very precisely. And Larry gets it and he realizes he's gone and maybe he files a lawsuit and he wants to get those documents. Well, in a world of paper, in a world before ESI, we would produce his reason for dismissal and that would be the only document that we have because when I, the supervisor, went to talk to HR about it, it was a face-to-face -face meeting. We used words. There was no recording. There was no emails. There were no drafts of documents. Um, uh, Maybe somebody actually typed up, maybe my secretary typed up the reason for dismissal uh, for my handwritten version. And once my handwritten version was, was uh, finalized, it was shredded. There was nothing left to have other than that re re original document. But now in the world of ESI, I probably sent a draft to the HR person. And the HR person probably sent me a revised draft with comments. And then I probably have some emails going back and forth. I just can't stand that Larry. His Presbyterianism is just driving me crazy. Or, you know, boy, I just, I'm looking for a reason to fire him. Is this a good enough reason? Is this a good enough reason? All kinds of smoking guns that probably had been said in that in that pre-1990 world but there was no record of it and it would have required somebody to fess up to something that they weren't going to do and but now with ESI you get the smoking gun you get all that background data you get to see who originated that document you get to see all the edits of the document you get to see the comments of the document um, you get a timestamp on things all those things are can be incredibly incredibly useful um yeah yeah you always want to request the esi in electronic form so you can get that metadata that embedded data as we were talking about and here's an example you know the the, the paper document just shows what it shows on the face but if you get the meta document you get who created the document when was it created where was it created who last accessed it how was it modified who modified it what were earlier versions what were some hidden aspects to it all of those things can really tell a very powerful story that might be helpful to you um, emails can't emphasize enough how important emails are and let me just stop here for a second and, and tell you that um, having worked as an employment attorney for I guess 20 years um, I saw pretty mind-blowing emails and it was always amazing to me how people thought that because they could dash it off in a second and because they thought they could hit delete it would be gone and it really didn't count it wasn't an important thing. And so they would pass jokes that were offensive or say things that uh, were just terrible, terrible things to say. 
Um, and so always, always in your professional life, if you miss everything else we say this semester, please catch this because this can save your career. Never send anything from an e in an email that you would not be glad to show to your spouse, to your mother, to your religious leader, to a judge and a jury. Um, if you aren't happy with all of those people seeing whatever it is that you're going to uh, send, then don't send it. Maybe go tell the person, maybe call them up over the phone, um, but don't send an email because there's no such thing as a deleted email. It's almost impossible to uh, forever remove that data. And the jury will see it. The jury will see it in permanent form and it will leave a very big impression. And they know, they know how people send emails. So in their mind, it really review, reveals your, your true heart, your true intentions. It's almost a, a, a mirror into your soul and so they they find that stuff very very persuasive so don't send emails unless it's very 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 safe very cautious but realize that you have to be very concerned about the emails your client has sent and you are going to be very very interested in the emails the other guy has sent you'll want to get all that metadata um, you're going to want to reconstruct the email conversation to get context and to get an understanding about timelines and things like that. Really, really important things. Um, here are some um, information that you, you'd want to get. Um, I won't go through the details of this. Um, if you happen to be a person who is technologically inclined, you know, maybe have an IT background or, or have some IT uh, coursework, uh, there's a big demand out there for ESI people to, uh, who have legal training as well to work in discovery. Um, and so that can be a very helpful area for you to explore in your career. Um, my experience with IT people and with attorneys, and I'm not an IT person, so I'm looking at it from the attorney perspective, is that we don't speak the same language. We don't have the same set of priorities. We don't have the same, we don't live in the same universe. Um, so when I would call up an IT person and say, we need this, I really had no sense as to whether that's a five minute project or a five day project. Just didn't have an understanding about that. Um, the uh, person who's hearing my request doesn't have an understanding about its importance or its urgency. And so there's a, and then there, so there's the, the, the miscommunications, but there's also um, the, the different agendas people have. I mean, honestly, I don't care about the fact that I just destroyed this IT person's weekend, that he has to do this. He cares, but I don't care, really. I mean, I, I don't wish him ill, but that's not my problem. Um, he, he has concerns about his normal work. His boss wants him to complete this project and now I've given him a project that has to be done before so that means he's going to miss that deadline and his boss is going to be mad. He doesn't really care about my project because it's not helping him impress his boss. And so um, maneuvering through that relationship can be very, very challenging. Um, another aspect is vocabulary. Many times I would talk with the IT person and um, I would say, well, tell me all the places this could be located in the systems. And they would rattle off a list, and I'd be writing it down, and I would say, any other places, any other places, any other places? And I would keep on going until they said, nope, that's a full list. I'm like, are you sure? Yep, that's a full list. And then a week later, something would come up in conversation. They'd say, yeah, and we can, you know, we could also look there. I'm like, well, that's not on my list. Well, yeah, I didn't think you wanted that one. I need them all. Oh, well, but that one, that's really hard to get to. It doesn't matter how hard it is. I need every single item. Oh, but gosh, that's going to be really expensive. You know, they look at the question through a practical lens. The law isn't as interested in practicality. And so you really have to educate and communicate and and get get buy-in from them and and listen to times where they say things that don't gel because many times that points to an underlying miscommunication that has happened. And that's one of the reasons why if you have a legal background, boy, and an IT background, boy, you are a tremendously valuable person um, in a discovery world.
So we can have lots of different places to find ESI, and it can be useful when you're talking to the IT people to, to have a breakdown. Well, well, tell me about the system overall. Tell me where active data is kept or inactive data is kept. All of those pieces of the puzzle um, and, and to get a kind of a big picture view and then to kind of drill down into all the uh, um, uh, constituent parts. Okay, we've already talked about this, but there's no such thing really as a deleted file. There's no such thing as a system that can't be gotten into. Um, it may be outdated, it may no longer be used, but guess what? We can still get into it. It may be quite expensive. Uh, it may be very time consuming. Um, and so there may be some proportionality arguments that we can make, but we can't say to ourselves, well, that would be expensive. We're just not going to talk about that in our discovery responses. That's not an option. That's what gets sanctions. Okay. Um, get forensic computer experts can retrieve data from uh, very old systems, systems that have been uh, damaged in a variety of, of ways. So. Um, don't don't assume that it can't be reached. One challenge with ESI is because it's um, um, data, um, how you store it can be very important because you know many times you will want to open it up and manipulate the data, organize it, remove some irrelevant pieces of the data and just maybe highlight the most important pieces of the data, the ones that are relevant to your story. But you have to be careful because you you have to have a version that is not manipulated, a version that's pure, that's going to, you're going to be able to uh, do a chain of custody on. And one effective way of doing that is to have an image copy. Now you, you start with an image copy, you make a copy, a copy of it, and then you might use that to manipulate. But an image copy is an electronic image of whatever that target system is. It captures all the data, and um, then you kind of uh, maybe make a copy of that and then manipulate that, cut out all the stuff you don't need, but keep this in a pristine situation so that you can get it admitted into evidence. And again, that chain of custody idea, being able to describe the, uh, the movement and location of evidence over time that it leaves one person's care to another person's care. Many times you have to prove up that chain, so you're going to actually have to call these folks as witnesses to prove um, the, the history of, of where it was and when it was. We talked a few minutes ago about the Rule 26 Discovery Conference. We, we talked about the plan, and now we're going to talk about the conference. Um, so get ready. Uh, I guess get, get ready for that exciting topic there. Okay, so the um, the, the parties' attorneys are going to have to meet and confer to discuss discovery issues, and they're going to have to develop that written discovery plan, and then they submit it to the court, and that's the plan they're going to be following. Um, again, it has to be uh, as soon as practical, which we already saw, um, but it's likely to need to be before the scheduling conference, um, and, and typically 21 days before. And then um, you're going to have to submit that um, to the court. So you have to submit that after that discovery conference. So let's just look at that. So we're going to look at Rule 26F. And by the way, I'm going to also, while we're doing this, look at one more thing here. So we're going into Rule 26F. Here is that conference. Again, this goes through the timing aspects, and this talks about what the party's responsibilities are in that conference, and then here we have information about what goes into that discovery plan. Let me also show you the local rules. Here we have the local rules, so I'm going to as you can see, the local rules in the Eastern District, and this is fairly common, are going to match the numbers. So we're going to go to Rule 26 to see what the local rules in our district court, how they relate. What, what are the particular quirks of our system? Not that they're quirky, but what are the ins and outs of our local system? And so here we have here, the first one, I love this, no excuses. 
Absent court order to the contrary, a party is not excused from responding to discovery because there are pending motions to dismiss, to demand, or to change venue. Parties asserting the defense of qualified immunity may submit a motion to limit discovery to those materials necessary to decide the issue of qualified um, immunity. Okay, we have notice of disclosure. The party shall promptly file a notice with the court that discloses required under, we haven't actually talked about that yet. And then we have a discovery hotline, also highly cool. The court shall provide a judge on call during business hours to rule on discovery disputes and to enforce provisions of these rules. Counsel may contact the due judge for that month by dialing the hotline number listed above for any case in the district and get a hearing on the record and rulings on the discovery dispute, including whether a particular discovery request falls within the applicable scope of discovery or request to enforce or modify provisions of the rules as they relate to a particular case. So let's go back to our conference. And this goes through what has to be in the discovery plan. So you're going to talk about what do we need discovery about? What are the subjects? When should discovery be completed? Is there going to be phases to it? Meaning we're going to do um, interrogatories first and then depositions or we're going to propound discovery on this point or that point first. We're going to talk about issues relating to ESI. We're going to talk about how we're going to handle privilege matters. Uh, we're going to talk about any particular changes that we want to the normal limitations on discovery. There's likely uh, standard limitations on the number of depositions or whatever. But you know what? If both parties say we need more depositions than regular, or we need fewer depositions than regular, and the parties both agree, then the court's likely to say that's just fine. Okay, so here, so now we're going to talk about the mandatory disclosures. Um, when I began practicing, there were no mandatory disclosures. I don't even think there are mandatory disclosures in Texas state court, and there surely weren't in Texas, excuse me, in federal court. Uh, so the only way that uh, discovery worked is when one side asked questions. And so if one side never asked any questions, then that side never got any data. I mean, they would get their, um, uh, if, if they were the defendant, they would get the uh, complaint, and if they were the plaintiff, they would get the answer. But other than that, um, they would not be getting any additional information. So there was nothing self-actuating about discovery. But now with Rule 11, there are mandatory things that both sides have to share, even if the other side is asleep at the will and never asks the questions. That makes sense. So let's look at how that process works. And by the way, we have a similar process in Texas State Court. Okay, so without the need for a request from another party, each party must disclose the following material to the other parties no later than 14 days after that discovery conference we were just talking about. So we need all the information about anyone who likely has discoverable information. What is that information? Um, copies of all documents in the possession or control of the party that obviously are relevant computation of damages, and any insurance policies that the defendant has. Each party obviously doesn't necessarily know all of the answers, but this is especially true if you're the defendant and you were surprised by the lawsuit, but you need to do a reasonable investigation given the time that you have, and you have to supplement your answers. Um, as is true with most discovery matters, um, the rules don't provide that you um, file these with the court unless there's a local rule. But let's go back. I think the local rule in the Eastern District does require it. Let me go back. Notice of disclosure. The properties will properly file a notice with the court. The disclosures required have been made. So you don't actually file the actual disclosures, but you file a notice saying, yep, Your Honor, we've done it. We're, we're good to go on that with that respect. Let's talk about expert disclosures. This is another uh, mandatory area of disclosure. Um, so you have to uh, disclose the identity of your experts, again, even if the other side hasn't asked, and the copy of their written reports, including all of the opinions, 
um, the qualifications of the witness, the compensation of the witness, the expert witness. Okay, so now we're, we're jumping ahead. <laughs> it's a little bit out of order. So we're no longer uh, talking about the initial mandatory disclosures that happened at the very beginning of the case. Now we're jumping ahead to the pretrial disclosure. So these are, we're now, discovery is closed typically. And so not longer than 30 days before the trial date, we have to give the name of each witness. Um, and, you know, designate whether we're sure we're going to follow them or we're just thinking maybe we'll call them. And all of the exhibits. Let's see, is there anything else we need to talk about? That pretty much covers it. So these are going to be, you know, obviously when you're 30 days away from trial, you have a pretty good sense as to um, how you're going to present your case and you have to share that information with the other side. Uh, once upon a time, what would happen is both parties would list, you know, a hundred witnesses. And so it was hard for the other side to, and let's say the trial was only the last three days. Well, obviously you're only going to be able to call, you know, at most 10 witnesses and probably not that many. Um, and so you had all these, these uh, other witnesses who were clouding the subject, you weren't quite sure where the case was going to go. But now, um, if you do that, the court's not going to be too happy with you because you haven't really disclosed what you're supposed to disclose. Um, this is just a, a rule of thumb for how, you know, up until this point, we've looked at due dates where something happens and then we go forward and we try to see when the final date is. But sometimes in the law, we are actually before this event and now we're looking back. And so we know this is going to happen on day zero. So when do we have to do this thing? We have to do this 30 days before. Well, it's the same rule that we have here where we're at zero and we're going 30 days. The triggering event, be it in the future or in the past, is day zero. We count all the intervening days, but when the last day, this day, or this day is a holiday, then we keep on going back one more day or forward one more day. So it's the same pattern, just in reverse. Let's talk about a scheduling order. Um, this is after the court is going to, obviously it's an order, so it's something the court does. The court um, does this after it gets the discovery plan. So after that conference has happened. So now we're no longer on the eve of trial. We're, we're, we're back in the, uh, in the early days of discovery uh, situation, okay? And so um, uh, this scheduling order uh, is designed to kind of give a roadmap for the litigants, for the parties to decide or, you know, how to schedule the, the, the discovery process, what the deadlines are gonna be, what, what, what's going to happen during that discovery uh, scenario. And so here are the uh, disclosure requirements. There's kind of an overview of the various states that we have. So it's kind of a table of things we've already discussed. Well, let's talk about the duty supplement. I mentioned this briefly a couple minutes ago, but let's uh, make a little bit more um, content about that. Um, so let's say that you've made a disclosure. Either it's um, a, one of those initial disclosures or it's in response to a discovery tool. And um, other than depositions, depositions are different. Um, and at that point, you, you, for example, let's say you are asked who, who are your expert witnesses. Well, you haven't picked your expert witnesses yet. So your honest and truthful testimony is, I don't know. But then three days later, you hire an expert. Well, you have a duty to supplement your answer at that point. You don't have to do it, you know, within 30 minutes of, of your hiring of the uh, expert, but you ought to do it within a very few days um, of doing it. And certainly if there are important things happening like depositions that might be affected by that, you ought to be sure it's even more important that it be super quickly that you communicate that. So just because your answer was, I don't know, that doesn't mean you're done. It's a continuing duty to supplement. Well, this concludes this presentation covering um, 
the uh, uh, kind of the initial parts of the discovery process. Thank you for your attention and uh, be sure to watch the next presentation where we'll start discussing the discrete discovery tools um, that we have available to us in the federal litigation process. Thanks for your attention.